Hello, my name is Bill Ozanic. I'm the EHS manager here at the Millport Sigma Belfont site. Today I'll be discussing with you some aspects of safety in your analytical laboratory. First thing we want to talk about are safety gloves. There are several different types of safety gloves you'll find in your lab. Most common gloves are your nitrile gloves. These are your general chemical resistant gloves. They are good for general purpose uh, for various types of chemicals. If you work with more hazardous materials like uh, caustics, acids, or more severe solvents, you want to go to a heavier style glove uh, which is built for uh, more, more hazardous conditions and more protection for the, for the user. If we're working with sharps, i.e. needles and or ampules, where you're breaking the ampule open, you want to go to a, a cut resistant glove. These particular gloves are a Kevlar back with a nitrile coating for extra grip. Please check with your safety officer for what gloves are recommended for your actions. Now I'd like to discuss the proper donning and doffing of your chemical gloves. Donning your gloves is pretty straightforward. You want to make sure the gloves fit you nice and snug. The better fit for your gloves, the more dexterity you're going to have. Once the, chem once the gloves are contaminated, doffing the gloves is a little more critical. You don't want to get your hands contaminated while you're taking your gloves off. So the proper to remove your chemical gloves when they're soiled, grab the palm, carefully pull the glove off of your hand. Once that hand is free, you go in behind the other glove, pull both gloves inside out, and you can just safely dispose of your gloves in your waste container. Bill, where is the best place to throw gloves away when they're contaminated? So contaminated gloves, every lab should have a contaminated glove receptacle. Your waste manager should provide that for you, so all of your gloves that are soiled and contaminated with any chemicals can go and be disposed of properly. So before entering any chemical laboratory, you need to protect your eyes. Safety glasses are what we use to do this. There are several different styles of safety glasses. Your most common type are your disposable safety glasses. They're available at any uh, uh, safety warehouse or distributor. If you're working with more hazardous materials, you, want to, you want, might want to consider using a safety shield. This fits over your head and over top of your glasses. This is used for when you're working with more aggressive caustics uh, and or solvents. If you have a, a prescription, your safety manager can provide you with prescription safety glasses just like these. I'll say the, the uh, prescription safety glasses have to have permanently fixed side shields and are rated for strike resistance. You'll see there's a little mark on the side that those are actually strike resistant glasses. Again, please check with your safety officer to provide you with the, the correct glasses for your situation. The next thing I would like to talk about is your protection for your body and or your clothes. Entering a laboratory, you want to make sure you're wearing some sort of protection for yourself and your clothes, and i.e. a lab coat. Uh, there are different styles of lab coats. You can have a launderable lab coat like I'm wearing, or a disposable lab coat like this. Disposable lab coats are nice because if they do become soiled, they can be disposed of just like your disposable gloves in your waste uh, stream, just like your uh, it, the way your uh, safety manager will direct you, uh, depending on what they're contaminated with. Your reusable lab coats will need to be laundered. Typically, we will wear these for a couple of days uh, if they don't get any, if they don't get soiled with any chemicals. As soon as it becomes soiled with chemicals, though, it now needs to be laundered. So you make sure you separate that from the general uh, waste or general um, uh, uh, clean or dirty laundry, and make sure that the uh, provider for your lab coat knows that that lab coat has been soiled with, with uh, chemicals, so they can treat it properly. If it becomes too soiled with chemicals, it might need to be disposed of. Uh, so if you get if you have a large amount of material on you, that lab coat, even if it is launderable, would probably be need to be disposed of. Is fit important for a lab coat too, Bill? So uh, your lab coat should be a proper size for you. Uh, wearing a lab coat that's too big could possibly uh, become awkward working with. 
Um, so you might want to get a lab coat that's reasonably about the same size as a typical jacket you would wear uh, out in the cold weather. This time I would like to talk to you about proper chemical storage. All chemicals need to be stored in their correct cabinets. Several cabinets are, are shown right here. A flammable cabinet is for your flammable materials, i.e. solvents, alcohols, and other flammable materials. Your flammable cabinet all need to have secondary containment. So if you do have a, a chance of a spill inside the cabinet, the material is contained. All of your materials need to be labeled properly so you don't have any uh, question of what is inside your flammable cabinet. Flammables must be kept separate from your acidics. Those will be stored in an acid cabinet. Acid cabinets are typically have a phenolic liner and a phenolic construction rather than a metal construction because of the corrosive nature of the acids. Again, secondary containment and proper labeling for all of your materials. All of your acid bases need to be kept safe, need to be kept separate, so you will have another corrosive cabinet very similar to this one to store your bases in. One last cabinet to talk about is we need to separate our toxic materials from our flammables. Typical in an analytical chem, uh, laboratory, we're going to find uh, fluorinated materials, i.e. dichloromethane, methylene chloride, or chloroform. Um, any chemical that is designated a toxin cannot be stored with a flammable. Please check with your eh &S manager for proper storage of your chemicals. One of the main safety features in any chemical laboratory is a fume hood. The fume hood consists of a few different parts. One of the most critical parts is the safety sash. Safety sash is used to keep uh, any chemicals that could potentially splash on you uh, away from you as you're working in it. We'll demonstrate that here in a minute. The airfoil part of the hood, when the sash is all the way down, allows the airflow to accelerate in and sweep any hazardous fumes or odors or uh, any type of uh, vapors out of the hood. Well, you can really hear it when you open it up. That's one way of telling that the hood is actually functioning. The other way to tell if the hood is functioning is actually to use, I like to use a chem wipe. And you pull it to the back of the hood and you actually see that the chem wipe is getting swept towards the hood. Don't let it go because your maintenance guys won't like that, but make sure you can tell it is working. The alarm you hear is another safety feature on most fume hoods. The alarm is set for the appropriate height of your sash. When you're working the fume hood, you should not work with the fume hood all the way open. Working with the fume hood all the way open lowers your face velocity and you potentially have uh, vapors and uh, fumes leave the fume hood and come back uh, at you. When you're working with the hood, your sash should be set at the proper height for your calibration for your fume hood. So as you're working with it, you can place your arms inside the hood, still have the sash between you and the hazard, adding another level of protection. The other thing, all fume hoods need to be uh, serviced and calibrated on a regular basis per OSHA. Every fume hood needs to have an inspection record on it, so if your, uh, your, la your laboratory area is inspected by OSHA, they will want to make sure that your hood has been properly calibrated and certified that it is working properly per the OSHA regulations. And it looks like this little alarm also is tested as well. Correct. The, the, as part of that, the alarm is also calibrated and tested as per that uh, same inspection. Okay, so how about handling things under the fume hood? So, let's that out. I have the hood open because we're not working in it right now. A couple things also to know about working in a fume hood. We can actually shut that alarm off. There we go. So, if you're actually in your fume hood, you don't want to use your fume hood for storage. However, if you have some common materials that you're using on a regular basis, they can be, they can be put in the fume hood as long as you keep them off of the floor so that you get the proper face velocity across the, the lower surface of the hood. You can set up some other devices in here to, to put some things in there, like some of your glassware that you're going to be using every day, and some of your other storage. Again, everything that's in your hood needs to be properly labeled so everyone knows what is actually inside the fume hood, and you only want to keep stuff in there that you're going to be using on a routine basis. Everything else should be kept in its proper storage location. So what about like when, um, how far back from the opening of the hood should you handle the chemicals when you're working in there? 
okay? So when you're actually handling a chemical, this lip in here is part of a moat system. So if you do have a chemical spill, it keeps that from flowing out of the hood. So you want to keep your materials about six inches away from the face of the hood. That makes sure you get proper velocity around the hood, around the device, or around the material. It can sweep all of the vapors and fumes away from you. So if you're working too close to the lip, it's possible that you could have, be exposed to fumes from what you're working with. Correct. So if you have your if you have your material up too close to the face, two things could happen. One, you could actually the material can can accidentally uh, ex um, be excreted from the hood or come out of the hood or you can actually get it to spill on you if uh, something would happen if something would spill and or um, be splash on you so you want to make sure you keep your material inside your hood keep your sash at the proper height so it's comfortable for you to work in again you would have your proper gloves off your handling materials um, but the fume is probably one of the key pieces of safety equipment in any laboratory now I'd like to talk to you about proper chemical labeling all the materials in your lab have to be labeled with the GHS labels. GHS stands for the Global Harmonization System. This is the only approved system for uh, proper chemical labeling that is available today. And on a GHS label, you're gonna find a couple of different aspects. You're gonna find the proper chemical name. You're gonna find the proper chemical symbols. You're gonna find the proper cast number and some particular information about your chemical. This all comes from the uh, the, uh, the SDS or safety data sheet that is designed for the that is basically aligned to this chemical. So check your S your your safety data sheet and everything will match. This is actually this system were, was designed for uh, globally, as in it was used worldwide. So all the no matter where you go in the world, these uh, these symbols all mean the same thing. So what on this bottle, Bill? This is dichloromethane. So that first symbol looks kind of interesting. What does that mean? Does so that's a toxin. So that is the toxic, uh, so that the, the silhouette of the person with the uh, kind of exploding heart is this is a symbol for toxins. Uh, the exclamation point is a, another symbol for other, uh, as other uh, toxic natures of it, and it'll be listed in the, uh, on the SDS. And then there's something about colors too so, with these labels. A lot of your other labels will have the NFPA uh, color coding on it for uh, health, flammability, reactivity, and other. So depending on what material you have, your NFPA ratings um, are, are separate from the GHS, but they can be, be used combined to make sure as an, on a label like this one for methanol, that we have the health for methanol as a two, the flammability is a three because it's very flammable, it's a non-reactive material, and it has no other designation. Uh, some of your other materials, like uh, your uh, oxidizers or your acids or bases, will have some other designations on them in the white box, uh, depending on what type of material they are. Please check with your eh &S manager and your safety data sheet for the particular chemical you're working with. And as an aside, too, just a, a tip for, uh, for you guys in the laboratory, these labels are available from um, various vendors. So you can purchase them and then use them to label the chemicals in your laboratory so that you have NFPA and GHS labels on them. Next thing I'd like to talk about is hazardous waste in your chemical laboratory. All of your hazardous waste needs to be controlled and needs to be disposed of properly. Before disposal, you have to collect it. So uh, some examples of how we collect our waste here is our waste solvents are collected in a satellite accumulation container that is properly labeled. Our LCs uh, supply all of the uh, waste from the LCs are manifolded and it uh, flows into the container. A vent line keeps it from overpressurizing. These, have, these are allowed to be uh, left on site for a reasonable amount of time or until they're full. Then they have to go to your uh, waste accumulation area. Uh, once they reach your waste accumulation area, depending on the size of your site is how long they're allowed to be there. Some of the other wastes we have that are typical in a lab are contaminated glasses. So you've got, okay, vials, broke bottles, things like that. Yep. Okay. Contaminated plastics. Pipette tips you would have. Or exactly. Well plates if you use those, right? And, and gloves. Okay, we've got a purple bucket to match our purple, purple gloves. We do, we do. <laughs> all of your waste streams need to be kept separate. Uh, all of your waste streams need to be disposed of properly. Your, uh, your uh, waste manager or your environmental health and safety manager will be working with a disposal company to make sure that all of your waste gets disposed of uh, per the proper regulations for the size of your lab. Please check with your eh &S manager for proper disposal of any materials that you have in your lab.
Thanks, Bill. And I also like the way you guys did the HPLC so you don't have to worry about waste going into a bottle that overflows. It just goes right into these um, lines here that go right into the, into the waste buckets. That's, that's good. And I just have a question. What, sure. I see this guy here. What's this little tote thing for? So transporting any materials around your lab should always be in secondary containment. These totes are used for transporting up to a gallon of material. So you can fit a gallon jug in here. So uh, if, this, uh, if this gets dropped, you have a good chance of the, uh, any of the material that could be come out of the uh, bottle that got cracked. It also creates a nice bumper. So if it does hit the ground, there's less chance of the bottle to get broken. But as you're transporting anything in your chemical laboratory, you should use secondary containment as a good practice. One of the other safety devices you should have in your laboratory is a spill kit. Spill kits are used in case you have a small spill in your lab and needs to be cleaned up. Spill kits should be placed where they're very conspicuous, i.e. on a hook like this one, so you know if it's missing. All of your spill kits need to be inspected on a monthly basis per OSHA and they all need to make sure that all the contents are actually uh, available to for uh, in the in the kit for your spill. Now that one's sealed up, Bill. So like, how how, how would you inspect something like that? So that's it, precisely, this is actually sealed because if we know if the seal is broken, that something's been taken out of it. Okay. So if you have one that is not sealed, all the contents need to be inventoried on a monthly basis per the OSHA regulation. That makes sense. Anywhere you're working with a uh, chemical, you should have an eye wash. Eyes are the most susceptible part of the body, so if you do get splashed, you want to be able to flush that out properly. This is an example of an eye wash we use here at the site. To, for, to use it, you would actually swing it into position, and you can push on it, and it will... Whoa, okay, get your hair wet too. Yeah. When, you have a, when you have a chemical exposure, Neat and tidy is, is the last thing you're worried <laughs> okay, about. You yeah. want to make sure you flush your eyes and your face properly. Uh, all your eye wash and the safety showers need to be inspected monthly. And then a, a typical good practice is to have them done by an annual inspection with by a third party, uh, just to make sure that everything is uh, functioning properly. Okay, then if you do um, actually get something in your eye, how long should you wash for? So a typical flush, a good practice would be 15 minutes of steady flow over your eyes and your face uh, to make sure you've got uh, the material flushed out. And if you have an exposure where you're using a, a, uh, an, eye, an eye wash, you really should go see a medical professional once uh, you've got the, the, the flushing after the 15 minutes, you really should go see a medical professional. Bill, thanks for that explanation on the eye wash. I, I just noticed there's this green tape around the area by the eye wash. What is that for? So all of your eye washes need to be fully accessible at all times. So you, a, a best practice is to tape off the area so that nothing gets placed in uh, that could interfere with your access to an eye wash. Because if you're exposed, your eyes might be compromised, you might not be able to see, you might know where the, the sink is so you can get to the sink, but you don't want anything in your way so you can get the eye wash into position and be able to turn it on. Because you might not, you might be by yourself in the lab, right? right. So you have to find your way over. So, okay, yep. thanks for that explanation. No problem. A sister device to your eye wash is your safety shower. Safety showers and eye washes sometimes come in separate units like we have here. Or they come in a, uh, a unit basically connected together where the eye wash and safety shower are all in one. That's a more uh, normal way that the, the newer systems are put in. Uh, again, with your eye wash, that system needs to be tested on a monthly basis and should be tested annually by a third party to make sure it's working correctly. So please work with your EHS professional to make sure your eye wash and safety showers are working as they're, as they're uh, designed. One of the other common devices you're going to find in your lab for safety is a fire extinguisher. Fire extinguishers should be located in a convenient location, should be, pro should be labeled uh, so they're easily found, and they should be inspected uh, annually by your fire uh, provider or and monthly by one of your safety professionals. A fire extinguisher is used only in the situation to save yourself. If you're not comfortable with using a fire extinguisher to put out a large fire in your, in your laboratory, it is not required. It should be only used for putting out small fires and to get you to safety. If you have a fire in your laboratory, you should uh, get up, get to safety and notify your safety professional and or your security force immediately. Uh, if you do not have one on site, please call 911 and get your fire department there as soon as possible. So Bill, I noticed that it's near the door. Is that, um, 
the desired location or is that just happens to be in this lab? Near doors is a very common place for them because you're using them to exit the building. Typically you want to make sure you have it available in case your, your way to the exterior of the building is blocked by the fire. And if you do have to use it, what's the proper, like are there steps you need to do to, to use it properly? Sure. Proper steps for using a fire extinguisher is very common, very simple. We call it the PASS system. When you get your fire extinguisher, P stands for pull. We want to pull the pin. You basically twist this to, to release the, the safety seal and then the pin comes out. You want to release the, the hose. Aim at your A, at, your, at the base of your fire. Squeeze the handle. When the pin's removed, the handle will squeeze and release the agent. And then you will sweep back and forth at the base of the fire until the fire is out. So pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. sweep. Pass. Pass. A good, rule of, uh, a, a good rule would be to have an, an annual training on how to use a fire extinguisher because you never know when you're going to need it and it's good practice for everyone to have that at least once a year uh, so they're familiar with how their fire extinguishers work and they know how to use them in an emergency situation. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Bill. Thanks very much. So um, any final parting words for our um, analytical labs out there? My final parting words for any analytical labs uh, I am a, of the uh, rule of thumb that a, a, a clean lab is a safe lab. So keeping your lab neat and tidy, all of your materials in their proper location, all of your materials labeled, uh, will make sure that you're well on your way to having a safe laboratory uh, for your area. And uh, I wish everyone good luck. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank you for joining in today. My name is Ingrid Heyenwall, and today we will be discussing reference materials and what differentiates a certified reference material from any other analytical grade. Today I am representing the company Millipore Sigma. I'd like to further explain that the life science business of Merck in Darmstadt, Germany, operates as Millipore Sigma in the US and Canada. This same company is known as Merck KGAA throughout the rest of the world. These pictures help to illustrate that reference materials impact daily life. The water we drink, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the drugs we take. Through calibration of measurement systems, validation of methods and quality control programs, reference materials ensure accuracy in testing. And it's testing which helps to ensure all of what we see here. So let's start with testing and reference materials. On a basic level, what does testing mean? Testing is the comparison of an unknown sample with something known, and this something known is the reference material. Testing can be qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative tests typically confirm the identification of an analyte or its presence or absence in a sample. Other qualitative tests can confirm confirmation of physical properties like conductivity or color. Quantitative tests determine the actual amount of an analyte in a sample, like the concentration of pesticide in a can of tomato juice. Other quantitative tests can, for example, determine the potency of a drug or cannabis strain, or the cutoffs for a drug of abuse in a patient's blood sample. The testing required to certify a reference material focuses on the material and its impurities. For the material, that's the identity, product purity, mass percentage or content, and physical properties. For the impurities, those are water, residual solvent, and organic or inorganic impurities. Typically the result of the manufacturing or purification process for the raw material. The production of a reference material is a key activity for the improvement and maintenance of a worldwide coherent measurement system. Reference materials with different characteristics are used in measurements such as calibration, quality control, proficiency testing and method validation. Certified reference materials are also used to confirm or establish metrological traceability to conventional scales. I will come later to explain a little bit more what metrological traceability means. To be comparable across borders and over time, 
measurements need to be traceable to appropriate and status references. Now, let's take a look at the different types of reference materials. Generally, there are five different quality grades of reference standards available on the market. As this hierarchy pyramid shows, the level of certification and traceability requirements increases for each higher level. At the top level are the primary standards. The primary measurement standards are produced by national metrological institutes like NIST in the US or GSC in Europe. These authorized bodies are recognized by the national governments as the sort of truth, considered to provide the highest level of accuracy and traceability in a reference standard. In the pharmaceutical world, you have primary companion standards produced by the pharmacopoeia, like the USP or the European pharmacopoeia. While not necessarily a government entity, these pharmacopoeias work closely with government agencies and are legally recognized in many countries as providing the highest level of accurate and traceable reference standards for use in pharmaceutical monograph testing. Whereas national governments give standardization to the top level, specific ISO requirements provide standardization for the next two levels, the certified reference material and the reference material. These ISO requirements include ISO 7034, 17025 and ISO Guide 31. Reference materials producers must meet these ISO requirements to manufacture CRMs or ARMs. Within ISO, which is the International Organization for Standardization, CRMs are considered to provide the highest level of accuracy, uncertainty and traceability to an SI unit of a measurement. Reference materials fall one level lower as they are manufactured and tested to a level less demanding than that of a CRM. ISO guidelines also prescribe that a CRM must be accompanied by a certificate of the reference material, whereas a reference material is accompanied by a product information sheet. Also note that while reference material is a quality grade, it can also be used as a general term to encompass all quality grades within the pyramid. The quality requirements for the last two levels are defined by each individual vendor rather than a bionational government or ISO. For the analytical standard grade, which Merck offers, the product is manufactured within the general ISO 9001 quality system requirement, not specific to just reference materials. A certificate of analysis is provided with an analytical standard. It contains information such as product identity, purity, and an expiration date. Generally, the level of certification varies from vendor to vendor. The lowest level is the research grade or research chemical. It may or may not come with a certificate of analysis. The data offered is not sufficient to use the product as a reference material, especially for quantitative applications where high accuracy is critical. For reference material producers, there is an international standard and three ISO guides that support the production and certification of reference materials to ensure that the quality of the reference material meets the requirements of the end users. The international standard, the ISO 17034, the latest edition from 2017, outlines the general requirements to be met by a reference material producer to show competence. The CRM should be characterized by a methodologically valid procedure, should be accompanied by a certificate where the certified value of the specified property is dated, including uncertainties and methodological traceability. The ISO is a worldwide federation of national standard bodies. The work of preparing international standards is normally carried out through ISO technical committees. This ensures that a CRM issued in the United States is produced to follow the same rules regarding documentation, certification and labeling as a product being produced in Germany or India. Besides the ISO 17034 guideline, three more guidelines give specific information about the production and certification of reference materials and support the ISO 17034 to ensure that the quality of the reference meets the requirements of the end user.
There's the ISO Guide 35. It provides more specific guidance on technical issues and explains the concepts of processes such as the assessment of homogeneity, stability and characterization for the certification of reference materials. Second is the ISO Guide 31. It describes the contents of certificates for CRMs and of accompanying documents for other reference materials. And last is the ISO Guide 30. It contains terms and definitions related to reference materials. Now I would like to go into more details regarding the requirements of a CRM which have to be outlined in the certificate of the reference material. Every commercial certified reference material should come with a reference material certificate. This is the most critical portion of any CRM. In all honesty, when you purchase a reference standard, you aren't really paying for the small quantity of material in the vial or ampoule. You are paying for the certification documented on the certificate of analysis. On the next slides, I want to show you the relevant information on a reference material certificate. For a THC cannabinoid mix, required by the ISO 17034. The ISO guideline 31 lists all of the features which have to be included in the certificate. Here on the right side, there's the list of requirements which have to be down in the reference material certificate. The certified property values and the uncertainties are the facts you surely want to recognize first on a certificate. We do put this information on the first page. The property values, in our case the concentrations, is a combined value and is calculated on the actual measured mass. The purity factor of the analyte, the measured mass of the solution and the density of the pure diluent. The property values have to be reported with a combined uncertainty, which covers all contribution which add to an uncertainty balance during the whole certification process. In our case, we calculate contributions from the purity factor, the material density, which includes a homogeneity study, the balance and the weighing technique, as well as contribution from ampoulin and our stability tests. EasyGout 31 also requires that the COA states the coverage interval was a specified level of confidence. In our case, we have a 95% confidence interval using a coverage factor of K equals 2. This is mostly used for symmetric distributions. Now, some words about purity. Purity does not include just chromatographic purity alone, but also residual solvents, water and trace inorganics from the manufacturing and or purification process. All are required to be measured to obtain a complete picture of chromatographic and non-chromatographic impurities in the material. For our cannabinoid mixes, we use the method of mass balance to determine all impurities. Each technique includes its own validated method for carrying out one part of the full characterization. The formula below shows how all the results from the different testing techniques are taken together to generate the purity factor for assigning the final purity. ISO 17034 requires a CRM producer to provide evidence of the methodological traceability of the certified value to a stated reference to an SI unit via a primary reference material. For our cannabinoid mix, we state the traceability of the certified gravimetrically prepared standard via the NIST traceable weight to the SI unit of kilogram. Additionally, each neat material has been analyzed and characterized via mass balance approach, which links via ISO 17025 accredited validated methods, for example, Carl Fischer, residual solvents, or loss on tinctions, via primary reference material to the SI unit of Kuno, mole, or kilogram. This is a graphic to show to you how the different traceabilities from the single components and the mixture derive. Now, why is traceability so important? It ensures for you, as a user of CRMs, that values you are getting from your analysis using CRMs as calibration standards can be compared, even if they are made at different times, at different places, by different people, 
or by using different equipment. The periodicity of validity, also known as shelf life or expiry date, and the storage information can be found on the first page of the reference material certificate from our cannabinoid mix, the data derived from stability studies. ISO 17034 requests short-term and long-term stability studies. The short-term studies leading to the retest date, the long-term studies at various temperature leading to the storage temperature and shipping information. Within the certificate, we also provide more explicit information about our stability studies. Regarding our retest date, we perform after the release of the product to the market further stability studies in tight intervals, which also gives us the ability to react on non-predictable stability issues or even extend the retest date. Homogeneity studies are another requirement of the ISO 17034 and is thoroughly described in the ISO Guide 35. It ensures that the 35 concentrations is within the uncertainty limits throughout this batch from the first till the last ampoule. After preparation of the solution, it is mixed for a certain amount of time to ensure maximum homogeneity. Then the whole batch is ampoled and samples are taken over the whole lot and analyzed for their verified concentration. The relative standard deviation criteria of less than 5% have to be met and this is outlined on the certificate of analysis. Now there are some more mandatory information which have to be put on the, certified, so on the certificate of the reference material, which I want to show you now. There is the title of the document, the name of the CAM, which is in our case the THC Cannabinoid Mixture 3, a unique identifier of the CAM. We use our catalog number and the solution lot number, its intended use a minimum sample size, instruction for handling and use, as well as the page number and the total number of pages, the document version, the description of the material, the name and function of the material producer's approving officer, and name and contact details of the reference material producer. Now, what are the critical attributes you should look in selecting the reference material most appropriate for your specific application? Let's have a look at the slide. For instrument qualifications and calibrations, establishing and maintaining traceability is critical. Your reference material should help you achieve this. In daily routine system suitability applications, it might be important to qualify something that is practical and easy to use yet reliable and cost-effective for everyday use. In method validation, it's critical to use highly accurate and precise materials to show that your method is accurate and precise. For identity and screening purposes, you need materials with proven authenticity and identity. For quantitation, assays or stability assessment, stable and accurate reference materials are needed. So, which grade of reference material should you use for each of these test types? Well, this chart helps to answer that question. Instrument qualifications and calibrations. These might be annual qualifications or routine calibrations. Higher order and compendial standards are most useful here to provide traceability and prove that the system is performing accurately. They give the traceability that's required to these I units which are required by the ISO 17025. CRMs also provide this necessary traceability and uncertainty needed for these tests. For routine calibration and system suitability, one can use a higher order standard, but it may be more practical to use a CRM. A reference material or analytical standard could be used if it's suitably qualified for the specific test. Just be sure to establish qualification of the reference material or analytical standard to a CRM before using it. For non-quantitative tests especially, 
reference material or analytical standards may be adequate. Method validation are a critical aspect of testing. In this process, you prove that your method is accurate and precise. It's really important to use a CRM or a higher order standard to establish the method validity. Reference materials are useful when CRMs are not available. Identity tests, these tests require authentic substance for comparison and the laboratory could use any of the quality grades listed. Assays, this is a quantitative test. Therefore, it's important to ensure a primary standard a CRM or a qualified reference material is used. For stability and routine quality control, one can use higher order materials, but it's more practical and acceptable to use CRMs. If reference materials or analytical standards are used, they have to be qualified for their use in this specific target method. The major take home point here is now fit for purpose decisions can depend on several factors from regulatory requirements, availability, and type of testing application to level of accuracy and sample metrics. The information you have seen here today is nicely summarized on our website as shown here. This quality webpage covers all the topics important to a laboratory's reference material buying decision. From SI units of measure, the reference material quality grades and metrological traceabilities to COAs and how to determine the best fit for purpose reference material. The web link is shown in the bottom right of the slide. I now like to thank my colleagues across our four reference material manufacturing sites for their contribution to today's presentation. Our four sites include two in the United States, Round Rock in Texas and Laramie in Wyoming, along with books in Switzerland and Darmstadt in Germany. And thank you for your time and attention. Welcome to Kennelab. My name is Raphael. Today I'll be sharing some tips and tricks for preparing instrument calibration standards. I hope you find this information informative and that with these tips and tricks, you continue to advance your laboratory productivity by reducing unnecessary downtime. Tips and tricks when preparing standards for analytical instrumentation calibration. First, determine which standards are required for your method. Second, determine what's going to be your working calibration range. Before cracking open your CRM vials, read the certificate of analysis to ensure that you follow the recommended analyte specific instructions. Specific instructions may include storage and handling, temperatures and conditions. We recommend preparing standards using volumetric or gravimetrically to ensure the highest level of accuracy and batch-to-batch -batch consistency. If necessary, be particularly mindful that some analytes are light sensitive and their concentrations may change over time if not handled in the appropriate glassware. Some analytes may adhere via absorption to the walls of the pipette tips, glassware, or sample vials. This is especially important when working at low concentration levels PPB and below. For this reason, it is very important to follow the recommended handling conditions in the certificate of analysis. It is also important to not introduce additional variables or contaminants into your standards. To minimize this, always use the correct grade solvent for extractions and dilutions. Utilizing an incorrect or lower grade solvent may yield additional unwanted bonus peaks in your chromatography or provide a high instrument baseline background, which may affect your method's sensitivity. After you have ensured that you have the required method analytes, solvents, glassware, and sample handling labware, you are on your way to generate, cali generate calibration standards. If you're starting with a solid material, it may be necessary to sonicate the standard solution to ensure that maximum solubility is achieved. Let's not forget that vial caps are very important. It is very important to select an auto sampler vial cap that is inert and would withstand multiple injections if this is part of your method requirements. Keep in mind that some 
out of sample vial caps may have a pre-slit which may cause sample or standard evaporation over time. In this example, we can see the effects of analyte absorption onto vials surfaces. The calibration curve on the left was generated with low absorption glass vials. The cal calibration curve on the right was generated with regular glass vials. As you can see, quantitation will probably be, be challenging utilizing the calibration curve on the right. The point here is that not all vials are created equal. Use the right vial for your particular analysis. When preparing your calibration standards, you must consider whether solvent standards are adequate for your particular analysis. Sometimes there are matrix interferences that can cause signal suppression or signal enhancement, and therefore a matrix match calibration standard may be more suitable. In this particular case, to ensure adequate quantitation of the analyte. Also, not all solvents may respond the same so you may want to explore a few options during your method development process. How long are your calibration standards good for? That's a very good question. And the answer to that is it depends. You will want to monitor the standard response over time and determine how long they are stable for under your current laboratory conditions. Utilizing the right solvent, glassware, and avoiding harsh conditions will ensure that your standards last as long as possible. Thanks so much for attending today's event. We hope that these tips and tricks will allow you to continue producing the excellent results you are accustomed to achieving in your daily laboratory workflows. For additional details on cannabis-related analysis and workflows, please visit our site at sigmaaldrich.com cannabis. Thanks.